Thank you so much, Imran. Um, absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you. So let's not underestimate how hard it's going to be to use synergies. We're not very good at synergy as human beings. We are pump primed, we're hardwired to be tribal animals. And we see that among health professionals. And we see it in the silos that exist within organizations. But I'm going to try to persuade you that adopting synergy in this space is the right thing to do. So what of this new direction of which I'm talking? This should possibly say a new direction for healthcare systems which have got this right, which have delivered on this journey. And it's based upon reflection. Because to start with, in sepsis improvement work, you have to be a disruptive innovator, which is a business term for a small business that comes about and changes the marketplace. You have to be a nuisance. You have to be prepared to never accept no for an answer, as Kieran has said. You then get your mandate, and these tribal animals, the health professionals, start to murmur amongst themselves. And as Kieran said, they start to say, well, this shouldn't be mandated. Some will say, well, I don't need a protocol because I'm a clever doctor. And others will say, well, what about antimicrobial resistance? Now, we all know and we have heard that as a quantum, the problem of sepsis is enormous. And some people who talk about antimicrobial resistance say that these improvement programs are fueling antimicrobial resistance because the 250,000 people that develop sepsis every year across the UK will all get antibiotics, and we're driving that with our targets. But I tend to challenge those people, and I say, let's look at people admitted with time-sensitive infection. And across high-income countries, broadly, four sources of infection give rise to 90, 95% of episodes of sepsis, being pneumonia, urinary tract infection, intra-abdominal infection, and skin and soft tissue bone and joint infection. So we did a head count across England, and we looked at our hospital episode statistics based upon the diagnostic codes. And we were looking at the top five um, diagnostic codes for patients admitted to hospitals. We qualified it by saying, we'll get rid of any patients who spent less than three days in hospital, and we'll do a head count. 1.7 million people in 2017 were either admitted to an English hospital with one of those infections or had their inpatient care complicated by one. Now, that's in England. So across the UK, this is 2 million people. Across Europe, this is 23 million people. And hey, guess what? They are all going to get antibiotics. So when we talk about antibiotic resistance, yes, we have to talk about community-based prescribing. Yes, we have to talk about our society's desire for cheap meat and the inappropriate use in intensive farming. But we also have to think about the quantum of consumption in hospitals. And we know antimicrobial resistance is real. Lord O'Neill, now a few years ago, said if we don't act today, then by 2050, we'll see 10 million more lives lost as a consequence of AMR. Now, I think Jim was being a bit optimistic there. It might not be by 2050, but possibly within our lifetimes, and almost certainly within our children's lifetimes, if we don't act now, we won't be able to treat sepsis. And those additional 38 million lives lost over and above the 11 million lives lost every year today, will tip the global population balance from one of growth to one of decline, an existential crisis. Can we do it? Is great sepsis care compatible with antimicrobial resistance? Now, something you won't know is that we achieved exactly the same across England as was achieved in New York State. But NHS England is very bad at giving permission to publish data. And it was interesting looking at the data Marcus has presented as a result of Kieran's advocacy. Because in 2016 in England, this is all hospitals in England, 32% of patients got antibiotics within the first hour. By 2019, it was 80%. Now, we didn't measure continuously, and this is not necessarily cause and effect, but during that time, mortality in England fell exactly as in New York State, from around 30% to around 20%. It can be done. What happened to antimicrobial use was interesting. Now, you might not be able to see this very clearly. Hopefully, those online can. But we do 
accounts from the Royal Pharmaceutical Society of the use of antimicrobials. These are individual doses. And you can see in the left-hand column that antibiotic use in emergency department doubled during this time, and that was alarming. In the right-hand column, though, total hospital consumption barely changed, a 1% increase, suggesting that we can incentivize better sepsis care without fueling antimicrobial resistance. And there are other examples. This was the National Sepsis Report from Ireland, which is not part of the UK, of course. And they've done some brilliant work on this. And in this, they were saying that their processes have improved and they're counting 17% more cases of sepsis in this year compared with the previous year. Did that impact on their antimicrobial prescription? Slightly more granular data than we had in England, but no, it did not. So while we're on this journey, we need to start measuring. We need to start looking for the unintended consequence because criticism and anxiety will come, and we have to recognize that. So what of this new direction? This new direction has already been discussed, and we've got a potential vehicle that we've been discussing within the Global Sepsis Alliance that actually started within the UK, called the Infection Management Coalition, available at theimc.org. And it calls for us, and this is a coalition. Two of the supporters are here in this room with Thurma Fisher and Bia Maria, and we thank them for their contribution. But this is industry regulators, members of healthcare industry, advocacy organizations, and professional societies coming together with a call to action that we have to consider infections management as four pillars holistically. Not pay lip service, but to do it properly at a policy level. And consider infection prevention, antimicrobial stewardship, the rapid treatment of time-sensitive infection, including sepsis, and outbreak surveillance and pandemic preparedness, together under one umbrella. Because people, I would propose, don't die of antimicrobial resistance, they die of untreatable infection. And all of these pillars are in the business of avoiding and mitigating harm from infection. We have to do this. We've demonstrated that this is an existential crisis. We know that if we don't act properly, then we're not going to be able to effectively treat people presenting with sepsis in the future. But this can't just be about policy. This has to be about the people. This has to be given a face, as has been described. I think some of us active in the sepsis world have been very effective at storytelling and giving sepsis a face. But what of antimicrobial resistance? To the vast majority of the public, it's a perceived future threat. It's not real, it's not immediate, it's not personal. And that's where the synergy can come in. We can learn about the policy successes from the AMR tribe, but they need to learn about storytelling from us. This needs to become a plastics in the ocean issue. This needs to be something that our children are talking about in the same way that they talk about climate change. And just to finish, there are tools we can use. Kieran's mentioned them talking about large format advertising in city centres. It needn't cost anything. Often this space goes unsold. We work in the UK with television programmes. We have messaging on all of our ambulances and so forth. And again, it doesn't cost us anything. One of our corporate partners, which is a frozen foods retailer with a 1,000 shops, has now sold 100 million milk bottles to British families with sepsis messaging on. But we're now working across the corporate sector. We're delivering free messaging, an online game, and an online video that they can disseminate amongst their clients, their staff, their workforce, or a community group can use it. It's been signed up to by large organizations in the UK, including Amazon, JP Morgan, and investment banks. And it gives us brilliant stories back. It tells us that people watching it have acted when their loved one. And one great example was this frozen food retailer is delivered bread by a large bread-making organization called Warburton's. And the finance director of Warburton's Bread watched the Iceland Food Sepsis Savvy Resources, and when her daughter developed sepsis at the age of five, she knew exactly what to do. If we get this right, 
will not save thousands of lives, will save millions. Thank you.